Good evening, everyone, and welcome. We are going to be talking about irritable bowel syndrome and our gut health overall in, with Dr. Udani here. So we realize you could have lots of questions and Dr. Danny's made herself available. You can feel free to give her a text at uh, 437-702-2112. I wanted to welcome Dr. Danny here with us. She is our naturopathic doctor here at Justine Blaney Wellness Center, and she is our resident expert on digestive issues. So it is an area that she has um, a special interest in, and she's really passionate um, and very thoroughly researched. She also has other areas that she really is um, an area of expertise in, in chronic pain and stress, skin conditions, and women's health. She believes that everyone has the ability to make healthy and long-lasting changes. Please help me welcome Dr. Udani. Thank you, Angela. Good evening, everybody. So good to have all of you join us today. So before we jump on our topic of discussion, um, we have some amazing upcoming webinars. Uh, for example, we have one on overcoming sugar cravings. This is a big one because I know a lot of us are fighting those cravings. So please tune in for that. We also have one on what your body is really craving. So what are some of the nutrient deficiencies and other things that your body might be deficient in and what, uh, what are the reasons for those cravings? So tune in for that as well. And then we also have ones on overcoming fear to feel safe with Dr. Justine and mindset changes that can help transform your life. So lots of exciting things coming up and we hope you tune in for us two with us for those so let's talk about gut health and you know if you've ever seen me if you ever met me you know this is a huge um topic that i love to talk to my patients on you know because it just affects so much of our health and our day-to-day -day lives like you would know if you experience bloating or diarrhea or constipation or even anxiety just how much um, our gut health affects our day-to-day -day life, right? You just don't feel good if you don't feel good in the in your digestion. And one of the main things that affect our gut health is the little bugs, little bacteria, little, you know, these good guys, bad guys that live in, in our gut lining, in, in our intestines. Because what can happen is if these guys, these, these little critters are more bad, compared to good, then we can have lots of inflammation and that can lead to poor quality of life, including um, difficulty losing weight, lots of inflammation, so joint pain, bloating, uh, brain fog, um, um, slowing down of nutrient absorption, poor in immunity, so getting sick more often, and even developmental conditions like developing uh, autism, for example, have been linked to uh, imbalances in our gut flora. So it's very important to make sure that we have proper gut microbiome. So our gut inflammation, what are some signs and symptoms? So you might think, okay, well, it's the gut. So of course, there's going to be some bloating, there's cramping, there could be digestion and constipation. But did you even know that it could affect things like your allergies, things like headaches and migraines, your joints, um, your skin? So um, acne or eczema, skin rashes, you can feel sluggish, you can feel nauseous um, when you have gut inflammation uh, signs and symptoms, you can have sleep trouble, uh, poor stress management. All of these can be signs of inflammation in your gut. It doesn't, it doesn't just have to be bloating, for example. It can be anxiety, it could be depression. They have, all have a connection to gut inflammation. So healthy gut versus a leaky gut. So you might have heard the term leaky gut or leaky gut syndrome. You might be wondering what that is. So basically think of our gut, um, you know, is as a big tube, right? So it goes from our mouth all the way to our anus and it's one giant tube. And inside of this tube is where all the food that we eat, it's digested, it's, re it's absorbed. And we also have a different bacteria living at different um, parts of it. So for example, our small intestine, our large intestine, most of, most of our large intestine has more of the bacterial components. Sometimes our stomach has them too. But um, what's the difference between a healthy gut and a leaky gut? So in a healthy gut, all the cells are healthy and they're working together. They form very tight, um, like a wall, you know, a wall to cover the inside of the gut. But in a leaky gut, these cells are damaged. The, 
the actual space in between cells are bigger because of uh, imbalance in the uh, in the gut causing inflammation. So if you think about the how thick this lining is, if you think about the skin, this is one cell, uh, sorry, multiple cell layers thick, right? This is about seven to 10 cell layers thick, just the top layer. The cell layer in the in a gut lining is only one cell layer thick. So that's like comparing cardboard to tissue paper. It can be very easily damaged and leaky gut can happen um, for a variety of reasons. Gut inflammation. So what are some of the root causes of gut inflammation? So we can have things like, you know, poor diet, of course, you know, lots of uh, inflammatory foods, like, you know, uh, deep fried, fatty, sugary foods, um, taking in a lot of um, things like carbohydrates, dairy, like foods that are more prone to be inflammatory. We could have low stomach acid, you know, because of taking a lot of medications. Um, we can have um, you know, sluggish liver or bile flow, for example, as well. So these are all, they, all of these can cause um, gut inflammation. And you can also have infections. So low-grade infections, um, chronic stress, of course, can also cause uh, gut inflammation as well. So what are some of the medications that can cause gut inflammation? Because I see a lot of patients that um, that come in and they, they're taking Tylenol, you know, or Advil or birth control, for example, or antibiotics or acid blockers. So things like Tums, uh, even Enos or, you know, any kind of prescription acid blocking medications as well. All of these can cause uh, gut inflammation by affecting the gut in certain areas. So these are all considered side effects of some of these medications. So something that I like to do is with my patients is trying to, you know, healthily, safely um, get them off of some of these medications so that, you know, you're not dependent on these as well. So another reason that can affect your gut is something called poor vagal tone. So what is the what is the vagal tone? So think about it as there's a there's a nerve called the vagus nerve, which means wandering. So this nerve actually comes um, it's a come from the brain obviously, and it goes all throughout your digestion. It also has a branch that goes to the heart as well. So having a healthy vagal tone means that you have you feel calmer, you feel more relaxed, you know, you have your blood pressure is more normal, you have a healthy heart rate, it's not, you know, crazy high, um, you have good digestion, you have good bowel movements, you know, you're going um, at least once a day, one to four times a day, and you have healthy blood sugar, healthy body weight as well. So this nerve is really powerful because it can control so many factors of our digestion and really our stress and our blood pressure and heart rate too. So what are some techniques to um, stimulate the vagus nerve? Okay, so one of my favorites is to sing or to hum. So humming, singing, that activates uh, some of the branches of the nerve, like that can go right here. So that can help as well. Laughing, exercise, uh, even cold exposure, um, yoga, thoughtful medication, uh, top of meditation, excuse me, gargling and deep breathing can also stimulate the vagus nerve. And you, you might be wondering, like, these are all, they seem to be things that help you relax. And that's one of the things that the vagus nerve does is it helps you feel more relaxed and more calm and out of that fight or fight, flight sensation. So the importance of healthy bowel movements, like I mentioned, we want to go at least once a day if more is better and you want to, of course, one to four times is ideal or after um, what, after you eat a good meal, you you want you should be having a bowel movement, you know, <clears throat> excuse me. So you shouldn't really be having a lot of cramping, straining, um, and it shouldn't feel like there's, you know, bleeding or anything like that. So uh, to have a healthy bowel movement is really important and because you're cleaning the pipes, you know, you want to keep the pipes clean. You want to get that load that you ingested and all the toxins that might be associated with it. You want to get that out of your body, right? So having one to four times, going one to four times a day is ideal. So let's talk a little, a little bit about the eight strategies to heal your gut and what is irritable bowel syndrome as well. So what is that? Because I think a lot of people might be wondering, well, I might have irritable bowel syndrome. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some of the facts. Only 50% of people with IBS actually seek help because, you know, it's uh, it's hard to pinpoint what it is because it's really a bunch of 
symptoms all kind of uh, brand, like all kind of um, umbrella into this one thing. And, um, you know, this could be lots of uh, discomfort, so lots of cramping, lots of bloating. Uh, you can have uh, this urge to go to the washroom very frequently in the most inconvenient times, or you might be really constipated. You might feel tired and fatigue and just, just a lot of discomfort in the in your bowels. Women tend to be more prone to getting IBS because there is a, there's a potential hormonal cause to it. Uh, in the States, over 12% of population has irritable bowel syndrome. And it is more common in younger people, people under the age of 45. And yes, it can be significantly helped with the nutritional natural supplements that we're going to talk a little bit more. So really, the cause of IBS, we don't really specifically know, but there is a bunch of causes that can cause it. Yeah, for example, stress. You know, you might notice that when you're in a, if you have IBS, stress can really trigger flare-ups and episodes of it. Um, there's also been, also been found very high levels of something called serotonin. Um, too much of that can cause um, too much of the cramping and then the stomach pains and things like that. Um, a bi bacterial or viral infection in the digestive system can cause inflammation. You might have a little bit of a celiac disease-like symptoms, so sensitivity to gluten. Um, and especially if, if foods tend to trigger you, you know, that then there could be food could be one of the reasons as well. So how do we really diagnose if you have IBS? Because there's really no test to really diagnose it. So the way we do it is that if you are if you have abdominal pain or discomfort for at least 12 weeks out of the last year, so at least three months of the last year, you should have, you're experiencing cramping, bloating, discomfort, lots of pressure and things like that. It doesn't have to be consecutive. It could be like you had a flare up that lasted two weeks and a flare up that lasts another like five weeks, uh, a month or two later. It's just within that one year, uh, you need three months of uh, or 12 weeks of experiencing these discomforts. And you should also have two out of the three of the following features where you either feel better after making a bowel movement or when it when this flare ups do start, you notice that your bowel movements change in shape or how often the frequency of it um, can change. It could be multiple or it could be too, like too low or the, like I said, the form. So it could be too watery or too constipated. So th that is how we really diagnose if you have a case of IBS. And these are, of course, symptoms I mentioned, you know, pain, gas, bloating, constipation, diarrhea, stress, nausea, just unusual uh, stool. That's just like not not the norm that you usually have. So there are actually four types of IBS. So not to make things too confusing, we have different uh, different uh, tiers of IBS, I'd say. So the first one is called IBS-D, which means um, it's about a third of the people with IBS tend to have more of a diarrhea type. So you have frequent episodes of diarrhea with abno uh, abdominal pain and things like that. Then there's IBS-C, which obviously stands for C, stands for constipation. So this is more constipation predominant. So it's also been affects about a third of the people that have IBS. So you can be more constipated, not really going every day, um, very hard, lumpy stools. Then we have the IBS um, mixed. So M or A, which is alternating, which is where you have alternating diarrhea and constipation, um, you know, during a flare up. And then there's also IBS U, which is un unclassified or unsubtyped which is people that just don't fit in any of the, the ones we talked about before. So here are some of the common symptoms. Like we mentioned before, you can feel constipated. You can, if, if it's IBS-C, you can have lots of pain, discomfort, but you're constipated. If it's IBS-D, then you have, you know, a lot of diarrhea, lots of episodes of diarrhea, pain, um, discomfort, and more frequent, frequency in stools. Uh, if you're IBS M, you can have mixed bowel habits. So, you know, sometimes some days you're diarrhea, some days you're constipated. And you can also have feeling of incomplete bowel movements. Like it just doesn't feel like you completely voided yourself. But in all of them, you do have pain and bloating and discomfort. So what are some of the major causes of the irritable bowel? So what is irritating your bowels, you know? And we have to think about the foods that we eat 
you know, and food sensitivities, of course, some of the foods that we can eat can be sensitive to our gut lining and can increase lots of inflammation. And there, it can definitely, there could be an imbalance in the gut flora. So this can be because of the, some of the foods that we eat, you know, let's say an undercooked steak or meat or sushi. I know I used to love sushi as well, but there can be, you know, because it's un undercooked, uh, you can have a likelihood of getting some bacteria into you, um, you know, from that, you can have a gut infection. So, you know, let's say you travel, you go travel, you get that travels diarrhea, or you happen to go camping and you drink unsterilized or unpurified water, lake water. So that introduces uh, infectious organisms. And of course, chronic stress can wear and tear on the gut lining as well. So number one cause, can, or cause number one, can be food proper, uh, poor diet, you know, um, especially if you have lots of processed foods, lots of foods that have chemicals, um, foods that are like, you know, conventionally raised meat and dairy, um, they're only fed on like a single grain diet, a farm raised fish and seafood, uh, food additives and colors and preservatives, you know, and, and things like uh, preserved meats, processed meats, artificial sweeteners, a highly processed vegetable and seed oils, all of these contribute to a poor diet and can cause inflammation. So this is, of course, you know, this is if you eat it every single day, something like this, oh, for years and years and years, this builds up. And that can, that can be uh, quite damaging for your lining. Food sensitivities, of course. So food sensitivities are not allergies. They're just foods that you eat. And when you eat them, it triggers um, sensations. Like, you know, this could be discomfort. You can have um, itchiness, rashes in your skin. Uh, obviously, can even cause water retention. You can have autoimmune diseases that are caused by these, like thyroid, um, rheumatoid arthritis, fatigue, cravings. All of these can be caused because of food sensitivities. <coughs> Now, case, cause three is imbalances in the gut flora. So like I mentioned before, when it's a normal, healthy, healthy number of bacteria that's living in, and they're good bacteria for the most part, you know, we have a very good relationship with the immune system, you know, but if it's a bad, like if the gut microbiome is full of the unbalanced bad bacteria communities, your immune system is on high alert because it's like, these are bad guys. These are dangerous ones. We don't want them around. And that can cause your immune system to be very, very, very on high alert and can lead to um, sensitivities and inflammation um, as a result of that. And number four was the gut infection. So, you know, this is where this, these can be hidden for, for a lot of us, you know. Uh, a lot of us can be actually walking infections because we just, the, these symptoms are very vague. So unless we do testing to figure out what's going on, we might not even think that we have a gut infection. So, of course, it can be chronic digestive issues. Sometimes, though, like, for example, um, I would have patients who said, you know, I've had very bad episode of diarrhea or, or I've traveled and I, I tried all these different foods and but it went away so it must be okay but that might not necessarily be the case and they might just be laying their dormant and, and until you have to go through a stressful period and then they flare up so anxiety for example depression headaches iron deficiency anemia skin problems can also be caused by gut infections chronic stress Effects of stress on digestion is there's so many and there's so much research on how stress can affect your, your digestion. You know, if you ever thought of like when you are really, really stressed and anxious and nervous, you feel the butterflies in your stomach and, and you, sometimes you feel like you need to go to the washroom right away. So those are signs that, um, you know, there's a big correlation with our stressful mind and how it affects our gut. And it goes both ways as well. If you have a healthy gut, you actually tend to feel calmer, less anxious, and um, um, just less stressed. <clears throat> Four strategies for IBS flare-ups with when you have diarrhea is these are some of the things to keep an eye on. And of course, this is only if there is a flare-up. And I highly, highly recommend to go see a healthcare practitioner such as myself or um, a natural healthcare practitioner, just so that we we know we have a protocol for you. Because, you know, in case you are taking certain medications, in case you have certain um, food sensitivities, we don't want to just take, you don't want to take this as just like 
do it for everybody because you know that can that can interfere. So taking active char charcoal, for example, can help. Using antimicrobial herbs, using a glutamine, and also closing the ileocecal valve can be some strategies when you have a flare-up. But know that you know you don't have to do all of these. We can help you figure out what you what's really the best one for you. So the first strategy we're going to talk about and is called um, taking some activated charcoal. So especially if you have diarrhea, activated charcoal can act as a binder. So it can kind of stabilize the um, the stool. It can reduce gas and bloating, and uh, of course, you know it can cleanse the digestive system, and it, it binds to toxic chemicals and can improve skin health. The other thing is because it's a binder, it can also bind to nutrients too. So this is not, you should not be taking this every day for long term because it will just bind to multiple things. So this is why, you know, it's important to have somebody in your health team that can let you know when to take something and when to take it off of your, of your protocol as well. Strategy two is using antimicrobial herbs. So like I mentioned before, a lot of IBS can be caused by infections or imbalance in gut microbiome. So using antimicrobial herbs like cloves, wormwood, black walnut. I know wormwood, you might think, oh, is there, is there worms in it? It's not, don't worry about it. It's very effective herb for killing, killing worms and things like that. But uh, use of these antimicrobial herbs can be very, very good when um, when you have flare-ups of diarrhea because you, you're kind of getting rid of the bad bugs. But once again, just like with activated charcoal, we want to make sure that, um, that we're not using this for, for long, long, long term because then it'll affect your good bacteria as well. So having someone in your team to consult will be really helpful when you're going through IBS flare-ups to manage it better. Strategy three is using L-glutamine. So L-glutamine, think of it as it is a little protein that helps bind the cells in your lining together to keep those um, links in between stronger and, um, and just help them stay together better. It can improve your metabolism. It can reduce um, its amino acids, so it can help with building up your proteins. It is a, it has an anti-inflammatory effect as well, and it can just help soothe the gut lining. Now, this is a strategy to, it's more of a physical um, motion that you could do to close something called the ileocecal valve. So this valve actually is, think of it like a little doorway between your small intestine and your large intestine. So it should always really be going only open one way, you know, which is from the small intestine all the way to the large intestine. But sometimes it can go the other way. The valve can go the other way and the stuff from the large intestine can push into the small intestine. So this is how we can make sure that it is closed or we can close it. And of course, you know, this is just like more of a stay at home to do, do it and that can help um, as well. And um, this is not indicated as a medical um, practice to do it because, you know, there are techniques you can do uh, at your doctor's that might be more helpful but this is something that if you are going through a flare it is to do it might might actually help with uh, relieving some of those symptoms okay so this is how we will do it so basically the ileocecal valve is like in the next picture um you want to do this for about three minutes is you know it's right in between your belly button and your hip so you want to put two thumbs in between and you want to kind of gently push them together and um you know basically deeply and firmly and you might feel a little bit tender but it's okay you want to massage that area for 10 to 15 seconds and um basically we are kind of mimicking the valve to close in the right way so let's talk a little bit about ibs flare-up with constipation so how do we treat that differently from uh ibs with diarrhea so let's go into deep deeply into this one so because this is an article with Dr. Jockers, we want to honor his, um, his all the information research he's done. So this is a product that he recommends, and this is to help basically to help reduce the constipation symptoms. So move uh, the bowel movements uh, more gently and to help relieve constipation. So we want to put this here so that we can honor um, all the work he has done on this presentation as well. And strategy two is of course, we want to open the, this ileocecal valve because if it's too close all that stool is 
hardening and it's getting stuck and it's having a hard time passing through. So what you want to do is you want to, instead of moving inwards, you want to move outwards to kind of help open the, the, the valve. And also you can do this for about 10 seconds to 15 seconds. And of course, if you feel intense pain or things like that, stop doing it. You should, you know, consult a healthcare provider for that. And the other one is optimal hydration. So you want to make sure whenever you are constipated, number one thing you want to focus on is getting enough water in you. So I've had so many patients that have told me they only drink one 500 ml milliliter bottle of water and they'll have like three or four cups of tea. But that's really not, you're not really getting enough water in you, you know, because the tea, it gets peed out and actually more water takes, it gets away with it because it's called a diuretic. So a lot of the water gets flushed out and you actually end up being more dehydrated. So make sure you drink at least a glass of water more if you are active and you're working out more. I always say the, the ratio is you wanna drink uh, half your body weight uh, in, in pounds. So divide it in by two and half that, you wanna convert that into ounces. So let's say, uh, let's say you weigh 200 pounds. So you wanna drink half of that in ounces, so 100 ounces a day, just to maintain your, your hydration levels. And you can add a little bit of high quality salt into it, like minerals, especially for sweating, because you're sweating out a lot of that salt too, you wanna add that back in. Other strategies for constipation is, of course, um, trying to have uh, magnesium, adding magnesium into your diet. This can be from leafy greens, nuts and seeds, things like broccoli, uh, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower. You can also, of course, do a magnesium supplement as well. You can try aloe vera juice, um, you know, um, eight, eight ounces or about a glass of mixed, mixed with water. Green juice with fresh ginger and lemon. Increasing the fiber, fiber vegetables. This could be a little tricky, especially if you have constipation. Sometimes that can make it a little worse. Um, and of course, ginger herbal tea. So, you know, there's a lot of options. And if you are feeling confused and you're wondering, would this work for me, my case, please come and talk to someone on our team because we'd love to have a protocol set for you because you don't have to do this alone. You don't have to guess about how, how to do this. So the five R's to healing gut inflammation and leaky gut syndrome is the things, a lot of things that we just talked about. So this is more of like a summary. So you want to remove anything that's offending. So all the inflammatory foods, infections and medications and, and stresses and really like figure out like what do I actually even need to remove? So, you know, there might be things you're taking that you think is healthy but could actually be triggering uh, a flare up. Then you want to, <clears throat> um, you want to, really replace the um, all the things that you might have lost. So in terms of your um, digestive enzymes or stomach acid, you know, and bioflow to so support your organs to increase digestive about capacity. And you want to re-inoculate. So add in the good bacteria, add in the prebiotic, good foods that grow the good bacteria. Then you can also do repair and re-inoculate at the same time, you know, adding in nutrients that help build the gut lining, like glutamine, aloe vera, licorice roots to heal the lining. And of course, last is you want to balance. So managing stress, getting regular exercise, sun exposure, so that these flare-ups get less and less and less. And, and ultimately, our goal is to, you know, for you to be symptom-free not have any of these symptoms for the long term. So of course, this is, this can sound like a process, you know, this can sound like there's a lot of steps. And sometimes, you know, if you do step three, before you do, do step the first step, then th things can go haywire. So this is why it's important to have uh, talk to a naturopathic doctor. So that way, you know, we we know exactly we have a protocol in, in place for you. So these are some of the eight strategies to heal your gut. So there could be an anti-inflammatory nutrition plan. Healing the leaky gut is very important. And identifying and removing food sensitivity. So, you know, when, we, when you're trying to identify, we can do a lot of testing um, for celiac disease or food sensitivity testing that can be done. You can also consider a low FODMAP diet. This is a specific diet that's for IBS, um, you know, IBS conditions. And, of course, addressing gut infections, finding ways to safely um, boost your immune system to get rid of these infections optimizing your stress, you know, and optimizing, uh, reducing stress and optimizing sleep, 
supporting your stomach acid, helping your digestion, digestion system work, and adding in those prebiot probiotics and prebiotics to boost your gut microbiome is also some strategies to heal your gut. So these are, of course, you know, having an anti-inflammatory nutrition plan. So really very, very easy. You want to decrease the pro-inflammatory foods and add in the anti-inflammatory foods more. So I always like to say, you know, do the 80-20 method, where 80% of the time you choose the healthier option and 20% of the time, if you want to, you can stick to the, um, you know, so you're having a really bad deal. Like I've actually had a patient talk to me that she used to drink one uh, can of soda with uh, every meal, every day, and after being in a protocol now, she doesn't even crave it anymore. Like she doesn't even want it. You know, she, and she's like, oh, she feels Ugh, like it, it just doesn't like sit well with her. So that's how much your body can change within just months, really. Uh, sometimes within weeks, if we follow uh, a diet, because, you know, your taste buds get used to healthier foods. And of course, leaking, healing the leaky gut um, by, you know, doing a protocol to help step by step removing the offending things and healing the gut lining and adding in the good bacteria will go a long way as well. And identifying removing food sensitivities, like I mentioned, we want to do some testing to see are there more hidden food sensitivities that you might not know that might be causing the flare up. So difference between a food allergy to a sensitivity is an allergy you get it from since you're an infant. So like things like peanuts, shellfish, eggs, milk, and it's immediate, you know, once you ingest it, or you, you feel it, you get hives, you can have anaphylactic shock and things like that. With food sensitivities, it's more um, delayed. So you might have some dairy, some milk or gluten, and you just, you feel okay for a bit, but then you start to feel bloated. Joint pain, you can get IBS, you can get flare-ups of eczema. So these are all signs of sensitivity. So finding this out can be really beneficial as well. Considering a low FODMAP diet. So FODMAPs are certain kinds of foods that can increase a lot of the gas in the large intestine and that can just make the uh, make you feel super bloated, distended, flatulent. So a lot of, um, for example, like onions or garlic, apples, broccoli, Brussels sprouts and things like that. So like here, these are the, some of the food lists that we try to eliminate or limit so that um, the, the gut can heal. And usually in my, for me, when I see my patients, I like to, I like to kind of uh, do, a, do a protocol where we do more of the anti-inflammatory diet first, because this diet can be a little bit excess and, 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 you know, but nonetheless very effective. But, you know, I like to gently ease my patients into a, a, a protocol. But this is also really good um, if, you're, if you've been experiencing IBS for many, many years. And of course, we want to address the gut infections. You know, whenever there is gas and bloating, we have to think about something's causing that gas to be built up. You know, it could be food, but it could be yeast. It could be bad, bad bacteria because when they eat the food, they ferment it and they release gas. So finding ways to address and maybe do testing to see if is there an overgrowth of certain bacteria that's causing these infections is another way. And of course, reducing stress and optimizing sleep. So having a healing diet, balancing your blood sugar level so, so that you're not getting those cravings that wakes you up at night, grounding exercises. I love to go in nature. I I kid you not, I feel so much better when I come out, come after 30 minutes or an hour spending some time outside in a park or in a trail, deep breathing exercises to do, sunlight exposure, Epsom salt baths, dry brushing, and even if you need a, supplementing with adaptogenic herbs to manage stress can be really helpful as well. And these are strategies that, you know, if you're having trouble implementing, then we can set up a plan for you to see how, how can we maybe do the ones that are most effective that can fit your life, diet and lifestyle. Supporting your stomach acid and digestive enzymes. So when when you're especially using, um, you know, acid and anti antacids uh, or even Pepto Bismol, um, Tums for a long, long time, it starts to affect your stomach acid. And as we get older, our stomach acid actually tends to go down as well, like less and less is produced. And when that happens, you know, our whole digestive system can can suffer because stomach acid is the first line of defense 
for all the bacteria, all the bugs that we eat. And also is it breaks down like all the meats, the you know proteins, the fats, it can help break all of those down. So if we don't have enough of it, we're gonna all, everything downstream can be affect can be negatively affected. So some of the ways we can improve it is, you know, of course we want to do this. Um, if you want to test a few things and, and then gently ease yourself into it, like using fermented vegetables, apple cider vinegar, uh, using ginger, um, you know, and even adding um, uh, supplements that can contain some of these digestive enzymes can help too. Improving microbial balance in the gut, you know, using probiotics or foods rich in probiotics like um, fermented foods like kimchi, sauerkraut, that can also help with improving your gut. And, you know, there are ways to test to see, um, to get exact answers. So test, don't guess. Especially if you've had irritable bowel syndrome for a long time, you know, there's very comprehensive tests such as GMF, stool analysis, that can kind of connect the dots to see what could really be going on. And of course, food sensitivity testing can, can give you insight, you know, into what is really going on in with your irritable bowel. So it is a common disorder and it can be unpredictable from one person to the next. So when you see um, tips and things like that, before trying them, you can, of course, you know, um, get a second opinion to see, will this work for me considering my history, my medication use, my allergies and all of these things? Because each one of us is unique and it's important to determine what is really causing the symptoms. Is it the food sensitivities? Is it an overgrowth of bacteria? Is my gut, do I have leaky gut? Is it stress? You know, so that way we can target the, the treatment to, to give you the most relief. And, you know, customizing your diet can, is really important too, removing some of those triggers and testing, of course, to see, um, is there something we're missing? Is there something else that could be causing uh, irritable bowel syndrome? So of course, the nervous system has a huge role to play with that here as well. You know, we think about the vagal tone. We just talked in earlier in the presentation. Um, when you have uh, IBS, it's easy to feel anxious. It's easy to feel uh, overwhelmed, uh, you know, because there's such a connection with the gut and the brain and, and how we think in our, our state of being. So there is a big connection with our nervous system as well. Here are some of our upcoming webinars that we will do. And I just want to say thank you for, before we go on to this, about coming and joining uh, in this talk. I hope it was full of information for, for all of you. So we have some talks coming up about overcoming sugar cravings while your body is really craving to figure out what, what are some of these cravings, what do they mean, and overcoming fear to feel safe, very important, and mindset changes that can help transform your life. So amazing, amazing webinars that are coming up. And so as always, please, if you have any ideas that you would like to, us to talk more, please let us know. And of course, we'd love to hear your feedback. As always, um, you can um, share this information with your loved ones and friends. And um, just, you know, so that we're all living that healthy, valuable, happy lifestyle. Thank you so much, Dr. Danny, for talking on such a subject that you are passionate about and so well educated. Thank you for bringing us along and really breaking down some complex um, subjects and giving us some okay. tangible things to walk away with. You're very welcome, Angela. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Take Absolutely. Take care. Lovely evening, everybody.